<laughs> Certainly, you had it all. And I almost have an idea why he didn't want to declare it open, because he says we have too many openings, openings, <laughs> openings <laughs> and nothing works. But I, I think one of the few ones that work are yeah, opening ceremonies. Yeah. If not for anything, usually for the party after it. <laughs> so thank you very much, Professor Rogu. I think it was a good choice to bring him on board. Can you please give him another round of applause? <laughs> Having said that, now it is my uh, pleasure and honor to invite none other than Margaret Mugarera. I'm tempted to call her president. Mm -hmm. Because, 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 apart from being almost President Emeritus of the Uganda Medical Association, she has also been President of the World Medical Association. I don't think there's any other person who has reached those heights from this region. And she remains very passionate about physician issues. She's a prominent person, a great doctor, a great physician, a great leader. We shall invite her to give the key to the address. Welcome. Chair of the Kenya Medical Association, which I call him the President of the Kenya Medical Association. First of all, I want to congratulate you for a job well done. I don't know whether he's listening to me, but I think he is. <laughs> for a job well done during the last two terms. Remember, I served seven, which is a Ugandan uh, thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I've actually been the longest serving president of the Uganda Medical Association, but you have to keep up with the times, isn't it? Yes. <coughs> the chair of the Kenya Medical Board, my senior colleagues, past chairs of the Kenya Medical Association, my senior, my elder brother, Dr. Frank Njenga, because we are both psychiatrists. My colleagues from Somaliland, Medical Association SMA, and my brother, Dr. Apollo Epuat, from the Uganda Medical Association, members of KMA and guests. I want to start by thanking the Kenya Medical Association for having invited me to make this keynote address. <coughs> and uh, congratulate you too I was elected president as the first woman to be president of the Uganda Medical Association in 1999. And how many years later, you have also elected my sister Jackie to be president. And I said to Jackie, she must be president, not head chair of the Kenya Medical Association. Congratulations, Jackie, on that achievement. I want to start by sharing a personal story. My presentation is on there, keeping alive and well a balancing act for doctors, and share my own personal story. In 2012, I was elected president of the World Medical Association, being the second African. We always say I'm the second African. There were two Africans, but that was a different story before that. Uh, second African of the World Medical Association, and the first African uh, woman to be elected in that position. And I traveled to South Korea to make a presentation, the keynote address of the Medical Women International Association in South Korea. And I traveled with a colleague of mine, a very good friend, who's now a very good friend, the president of the American Medical Association. And um, she's a gastroenterologist. And uh, she kept saying, Margaret, you've got to check yourself out. You've got to check yourself out. Every two years, do a colonoscopy. I said, what? So that is that. I've heard about that remotely. So when I retired last year, fast track, last year I decided to have early retirement. I think I'd done enough damage in the health sector. <laughs> I'd done 19 years in, uh, in the Madare of, uh, of Uganda, the Tarika Hospital. <laughs> Not as a patient, almost as a patient. 
But I'd also done 12 years in the National Hospital in Mulago, and I was a senior consultant, and I was actually in charge of the, what they call clinical head. I was in charge of the internal medicine um, and the, the psychiatry wards. Um, and I had done that work. And I said, let me retire. But as I, I retired, after I retired, I said, let me do a few checkups. You know, my good friend, Addis, had said, do a colonoscopy. So I went to the uh, friend of mine, a gastroenterologist, and I said, no, I'm a surgeon. And I said, you know what? I want to do a, a, a colonoscopy. And he said, what the hell for? Do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have that? I said, no. I said, but I just want to check out. After that, I'll do my teeth. So, <laughs> so he said, okay, reluctantly, and did the colonoscopy. And lo and behold, in the ascending colon, there was a tumor there. A tumor seated there, which may have been about six weeks, was six months, probably would have occluded that large gut. And I'll probably have been rushed off somewhere. And you know I'm always in the air, so I don't know what that would have been. So there was the tumor. And they did the biopsy and it was cancer of the colon. And I said, I'm feeling so well. You know, can this really be? And they said, yes, it's in your colon. We are shocked ourselves because you don't have any symptoms. You are nice and you know, look okay. So I said, okay. So then, of course, I became the traffic, the people you're talking about. I was doing some work with Kampala International University, which then said they would sponsor me and they'd look after me. And off I went to the Apollo hospitals in Chennai. Uh -huh. I was put on chemo. I never knew I'd be on chemo. At the age of 58, you know, chemo. I was put on chemo. I started chemo. Fortunately, it didn't throw out my hair, didn't make me vomit, it didn't do anything to me. In fact, I, every time they, I finished the chemo, I'd go, my friends would ring me and say, where are you now? And I'd say, I'm in the mall. And I'd say, goodness, is she really sick? Is she making it up? And I started the chemo. And after the chemo, they said, now we're going to operate. This is the time. And believe it or not, alive as I was, this thing had gone to my, my liver. Yes, it had gone out of my gut and gone into my liver. So they resected about three different areas in my liver. They also resected a whole big chunk of my ascending colon, and they also took out the appendix, and they said you had two stones in the gallbladder, they took out that as well. I was eight hours in theater in Chennai, in the Apollo Hospital. And I came out of that hospital, I went home, and I continued chemo. I'm continuing chemo, because there's a small little thing left now, everything else is clear, except for a small little thing left in the liver. They want to just resect it in and now. But I'm, I had my chemo troubles this morning, and I came. But what has made me what I am? I want to just say, do I look like a, I have cancer? <laughs> <laughs> you know what has made me what I am? First of all, the gift of life, God. Recommitting myself to God and saying, God, I surrender everything to you. And that has really worked. The second thing has, that has worked are my colleagues. And Apollo is here. I have received so much support from my colleagues. People sending me $300, $500, $100. You do that with whatever you want. Government has been very kind to me because I think I've also done something for government. But my friends have been nice. Frank there, you know, people asking me, Chair of KMA asking me, how are you now? Jackie asking me, how are you? Because they know I've been ill. But I've been ill, but not really ill. I don't know how to say this. I've never been down, have I? No. But I'm, 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 I have this thing that I've been carrying. But I didn't know I had it. So let me make my presentation and we shall talk a bit more about it. Why is it important for doctors to be well? Well, first of all, if you look at the... I'm, I happen to be the vice chair, Mr. Chairman. I happen to be the vice chair of the Uganda Medical and Dental Practitioners uh, Board or Council. I'm the vice chair. And for the last four years, I've been the chair of the Ethics and Disciplinary Committee. So I'm, I'm not quite... I'm not loved as much as I'm loved here <laughs> by the doctors in Uganda. But um, there are three basic principles I keep saying. One is compassion for us as doctors. Compassion, if you don't have compassion for your patients, you have no business in this. You have no, no, no place in this business because this business is about compassion. If you join the profession to get money, uh, forget about it. First and foremost, it's compassion for our patients. Two is competence, the need for us to remain competent. We must remain competent, and that's why we come for these conferences, these workshops. But the third thing is professional independence. You know, autonomy is very, very important. But, the next slide. We're not going to do that when we have all these other things that are going through, that we go through. 
And I want to say that most common ones are those, and I'm not saying it because I'm a psychiatrist, but I think you've already heard that these are the most common ones. Because we could have these in this room, isn't it? We have them. You don't have to, you can wear a tie and have stress, isn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, anxiety disorders, depression, I said these, I'll put suicide as another, you know, suicidal behavior as another suicidal behavior. But I put, I put depression there. Alcohol and substance abuse, very big ones. And you, as we, as you, our Uganda Medical and Dental Practitioners Council, picking a leaf, I think, from, like, we always picking leaves from you people, we've come up with a, 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 a fit to practice called T. And so we're looking at that. But as Uganda Medical Station, we are also here to learn what you are doing about well-being. So we are trying to learn and see what we can pick up. You are about a, a bit ahead of, of us. But these are the four. Now, we don't have enough evidence for these, really, among doctors. I mean, people do studies among medical students. That's nice. We like to do them among medical students. You know, we like to make them look like they, they have problems we don't. But uh, it's very difficult to do these, but our plan is that we need to do these as well. I don't know if the Kenyan experience, I didn't, we didn't talk about this, but the Kenyan experience, what these are among doctors. Stress you can easily pick up. I don't know about alcohol and substance abuse. But we do have many, many doctors who are on, you know, you name it, they're using diazepam, sleep, you know, um, you know, if people still use phenobarb, surprisingly, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So we, we've got all that. Then, of course, alcohol is a big one. Alcohol is a big one. Uh, next slide. But we are doing a small survey. Um, since 1986 so far, we've picked up 470 doctors who have died in Uganda since 1986. And uh, we've got the names, we've got you know, piles and piles of data. And this is just, this is work in progress. Um, we can't find the data in about 5%, so it doesn't add up to 100. But so far, this, this is what we've found. Um, we have 44.9%, that is almost 50%, was HIV AIDS. Uh, HIV AIDS has really mowed down our doctors. Um, some of these, and these are doctors not only in Uganda, Ugandan doctors in Uganda, but Ugandan doctors all over the world who are picking up this information. Um, so when I say 470, it's not only those in Uganda, but outside as well. Uh, cancer is a big one. As you can see, 13.6% uh, so far. Cardiovascular diseases, road traffic accidents, surprisingly, and liver diseases, diabetes. Of course, with Uganda, you have gunshot wounds if you're talking about 1986. Um, and of course, suicide is another one that's there so far. But this is work in progress. Um, it, you know, you can see Ebola there for uh, about uh, you know 0.9 percent. But this is the big ones are HIV, AIDS, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, um, liver diseases, diabetes. So it gives us an idea of the morbidity as well in terms of these diseases, and that these are the sort of things that we should be addressing as we start our, our well uh, um, uh, doctor uh, well-being or wellness or well-being program. Um, on to the next slide. Um, as still among the 470, uh, um, we found that um, you know, quite a big chunk of them were medical officers at the time of death. So they were quite young uh, in terms of the service. Um, senior consultants, you know, 8.5%. But you can see that the lecturers are down there at one point. I don't know why senior lecturers are down at 1.7. Goes to show you how much work you do. You should get out of there, Dr. Anatoly. You don't think you're doing much work there. <laughs> but you can see, um, this is all the stuff that we have at the moment. But we are going to be able to share it with you um, because we really want to, we, as we, we begin to the program. Um, but you can see, um, this is what we have so far. Um, on the next one, this is the mean age, you know, versus the diseases themselves. And you can see uh, suicide, 33 years, um, 38 years as the mean age for drugs. But alcoholism is 48, cancer is 59, 59 this year, so you can see I fall in very nicely there. This is mortality. Somebody rang me yesterday and said, could you please remove me from the mortality list? I'm working in South Africa. I'm still alive. He, says, he said, I'm alive and kicking. But you, you can see that, um, you know, so we are still trying to get it right. So next slide. Um, now, why do, we have, why do we have all this morbidity and mortality, which is really high, you know, if you think about it? To lose 470 doctors in Uganda, which has a, you know, a small population of doctors, um, you can imagine what's happening with nurses and everybody else. Um, the working environment, of course, uh, very quickly patient load. We all have huge patient load. 
uh, patient load, you know, work to do with the increasing population. Um, one time we had our president coming, uh, President Museveni hosted President Moy to, to Uganda. And both people got up and said, you should have more children. There's plenty of land. Everybody, and it was the launch of the world, um, what did they call it, the population report? Mm -hmm. <laughs> very well with the rest of us who have been there for, to launch the report. Uh, to have both our presidents saying that we should have more and more. And Uganda people have really listened to the president. <laughs> <laughs> they tend to listen. And uh, our fertility rates have refused to go down. We really have a huge, uh, the population rate, growth rate is really big. Working hours, you know, incredible. Um, time between shifts, uh, enough to rest. Rosters, we found that rosters are very big issues. In ma health managers, uh, we've been going around as medical council and we found that the people gave up on more health rosters. They call people and say, come, there's somebody dying, in, 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 a woman is having bleeding, and somebody's at a wedding and says, but where's the, but I wasn't on the roster. Oh, who told you there's a roster? Says the medical superintendent, you know? So it's, it's that sort of thing. Support supervision, uh, that is something that uh, we, we, we in Uganda have uh, been weak on. I'm talking about clinical support. Administrative support, we are very good at that, you know? You know? But when it comes to clinical support, that's where we are very good. And, and we've had this decentralization, but we haven't really gone down to really support our young people there who we have thrown out there in the districts to work. So clinical support supervision. Um, communication, um, very important. Appraisal, which has feedback, positive feedback. That is something that is an issue. And violence in the workplace to verbal sexual harassment um, are still areas that, uh, that there are still some of the issues. On to the next one. And there's a lifestyle as well. Uh, well doctors, we don't keep time. You're talking about time. Somebody's talking about time. You're talking about time management. But time management, uh, and many times when you ask, but why didn't why didn't you come to the, the, the KMA or UMA conference? Or you know I didn't have the time. You wonder. You know we didn't have the time. So time management is another one. Alcohol, excessive consumption, it seems to be the order of the day in our profession. Tobacco, smoking, drug use, and misuse. Next one. Um, again, why? Um, many times when we have, if you go to our regional referral hospitals, for example, in Uganda, you find that um, you'll find only one surgeon. There should have been three, but you have only one, because retention is a very big one, attraction and retention. And therefore, the person will be on duty the whole year. And the next year, and the other year. They can't, don't have anyone to delegate to. As a senior consultant, who do you delegate to a senior consultant surgeon? You can't delegate to the, to the clinical officer, surely. <laughs> so it's a bit difficult. So delegation is an issue. Um, remuneration, health insurance. I would not talk much about remuneration that we know. Health insurance um, for us, that's why I was whisked off to India. For us, as, because even within the, our countries, we as, health, as doctors many times are not able to afford the care that we need, which is a pity because you work for a, uh, you work for a population for so many years. And when it comes to you being ill, you're not, they're not able to look after you. And, and then you have to look around, uh, short of going on television and saying, you guys, I need some money. Uh, you know, if you're lucky, you have somebody to, some way of sponsoring yourself. But um, there's no, we need to think about that for us as doctors. Compensation for occupationally acquired hazards, that, that acquired hazards. Um, again, that's a, another one. Continue professional development, the need for us to keep up um, with, with the, the the latest information technology, but also the practicing registration demands, you know, the requirements that you need to be doing these many hours in these many, you know, areas, etc. But also there's the litigation. We do have people now who are wide awake. And we, the medical boards and councils, are busy giving them awareness, and the doctors are very angry with us. They're saying, why are you making them aware of this stuff? You know, so they're on there, people are losing property, losing money because of that. And of course, professional indemnity in some of our countries, especially African countries, a lot of our countries, we don't have um, access to that. Now, next one, poor health-seeking behavior, and I've talked about that. And I think a lot comes from the training. We've seen our seniors, right from the seniors when I was an intern, you were told that your, your health didn't matter. You know, I'm not feeling, oh, well, don't even talk about that. Your health doesn't matter here, you know? You are there because of the patient. I can still remember a professor telling me that, telling us that, that you are there because of the patient. Uh, and it was hammered into us. And uh, your rights are not important. Uh, uh, you have no, if you're going to be ill, you have no place. Go to join veterinary medicine if you're going to be, you're, you're going to be whimp, whimpering and talk, complaining about your health problems. And there have been many, many, many problems where people are asking 
uh, and especially as psychiatrists, we have so many of our colleagues, doctors, who are being advised to, to retire in, on medical grounds, um, not even being in a chance for treatment. And again, we need to, you know, so people tend to then not seek, um, um, uh, you know, seek health. Um, and of course, a lot of it, we get it from our role models. I remember seeing uh, an obs gyne, uh, senior, uh, a very senior consultant in Murago Hospital, on the week that he died, they told us he had insisted on being put on the roster and uh, he had edema that went right up to here. He actually collapsed on, at home when he opened his car and fell in the compound and collapsed dead. And he had spent a whole week with edema, you know, above the knee, and he had insisted on being put on the roster, you know. Uh, that, uh, so when you look at role models like that, we see them as heroes, isn't it? As the profession. Those are our heroes, isn't it? Dying on the battleground, that sort of thing. <laughs> Treatment of ill colleagues. The way we treat our colleagues, you know, it's as if it's a dirty word to say, I'm not feeling well. And you're seen as a weakling, and, uh, and uh, people have such neg especially the managers, we have such negative, you know, attitudes towards people who complain about illness. Uh, and and, 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 and uh, even as students, you know, you look at your fellow students, he's always grumbling. It where is he in the profession? You should go do something else. We used to call people penguins across the campus. Go to go become a penguin, you know that sort of thing, and uh, you know, and this is by peers, by teachers, but also by employers as well, you know, the employers as well. Um, next slide. And a lot is to do with maybe the people who join the profession. Let's think about that. We all seem to have something in common, isn't it? Uh, we are the same personalities who go. I hope we're not the same personalities who go to psychiatry surgery and to wear, but we do tend to be the same sort of people. People are out there to save the world, isn't it? Yeah? Save the world and you're compassionate and you're out and you know, you, yourself doesn't matter and it's, I'm a Rotarian, we say service above self and you're like, you know, that sort of person. So it's, it's the, the whole training, it's the, it's, the, it's the people who join the profession, I've said, but also the training and I've said that they're saying, the more perfectionist you are, the better it is, you know. The more obsessive you are, you know, if you keep coming, going back and washing your hands 20 times for you in the profession. <laughs> you know, it's good to be that sort of person. So the more obsessive you are, the more perfectionist you are, you know, the more unbalanced you are, you know, in terms of I have no time for my family, I have no time for my, you know, the more unkempt you look, isn't it? Yeah, that sort of thing. So those are things that score you high, and this is really a pity that uh, those sort of things we look at in, in profession. The system of selection for the course is also matters. And I think we need to be looking at this because it's entirely on academics. It's nothing to do with personality. You know, like it is elsewhere. You go to UK, you go to US, I think you need to sit ex sort of personality assessments to see whether you are that sort of person. And when I talk about personality, I'm talking about coping. Are you sort of, how is your coping? How are your coping? Um, how do you cope with stress? How do you cope with these emotions which are related to seeing people suffering and people, people dying? Um, and then, of course, the ability to balance social life. I used to wonder when we went to the Health Service Commission for an interview as a, to be a consultant or senior consultant. I remember Professor um, George Kamia, Professor Kiri and our colleagues would ask you, what do you do in your spare time? And you look and say, what? what is he asking me? What? Do you play golf? And you think, do you play, you know? And the people who scored, and there was a score against it, apparently. So that was good. It was a, a score against it. I, I don't know what, what the score was, but there was a, what was a score against that. So the ability to balance your social life with your work, with your training as a student, should be very, very important on the people that we bring into the profession. I, I, I hope I, maybe I would not have been brought into the profession, but the type of people that we bring in also matters. And I think we've got to get another way of, bring, of, of screening people to make sure that the right people join the profession. Not the right, but the people who are most appropriate join the profession. On to the next one. So that is very, very important. And in pre-entry screening for mental health problems. Because really, the truth of the matter, those of us who have been helping have seen that those who, there are people who really cannot manage this profession. And I'll say, we've done so much to try and be very, very, you know, and they will not, and it's not good for them. If I can say that, it's not good for them. But we sometimes push them. And I think we could be um, trying to see how we can do that in medical schools, but also in employment as well. Um, and unfortunately, um, confidential support services are very, very important. Again, it's a suggestion I want to make, and I, I'm sure you've already dis discussed this. Counseling services, I remember when the British Medical Association started 
their online counseling, anonymous uh, confidential counseling service. They had thousands of people, I think they're talking about 100,000 or so, calls coming in. Um, and, and that was, you know, you could see, you know, but you have to have professional people behind the, te the telephone, of course. People who are, 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 don't have the same problem, but people who, who are able to, you know, to deal with the issues. And, and, and uh, you know, because um, I remember I once received, I'm not a counselor myself, I'm not a professional counselor. I have a bit of counselling skills, but I'm not a professional. But I remember getting a telephone call from a doctor because I was president of the Uganda Medical Association. So he felt it appropriate to ring me as president to tell me about his, his marriage problems on the phone. And uh, we spent the whole, you know, like two hours on the phone and went on and on and on. <laughs> and I think I didn't do him justice because I'm not a professional counselor. After some time, I became quite irritable about, you know, <laughs> some of the things he was saying then, because he kept repeating them. So I think we need to really have people who are professional <laughs> behind these counseling services if we want to have this online. Now, referral of specialized care is very, very important. We sit here and we think that it's very easy. Doctors just refer themselves to what, where they need help. It's not true. We need to have real, real good referral services. People need to be able to feel confident that they are confidential, confident that you're going to refer them appropriately, uh, and, and it's very, very important. I think one of the things that, that we do to our colleagues is that we don't treat them as professionally as we treat other people. Uh, and that is really an injustice that we do. We don't intend to do it, uh, uh, you know, but sometimes I think we even in denial, in a way. We are saying, oh, you don't have that much of a problem. Let me meet you at the golf club, or let me meet you at, and we can talk about it. Oh, no, 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 you're not that sick, you know? Uh, I have the same problem, you know? Oh, let me just write something for you here in the corridor. You know, so I, I, I think that's, some of, that's the injustice that we do to us. So we need good, you know, we need to have a service where we can refer our, our, our colleagues for specialized care, and the best specialized care possible. And of course, medical legal matters, I know that KMAs are quite advanced on that, on being able to you know, have a service for that sort of thing. I'll move on to the next one as a suggestion. And I've talked about the training. We need to have this paradigm shift, um, come from where we say you are, the, you are more important, the patient is more important than you. For people to know that, you know, that, that the doctor's well-being, teach our medical students to know that their well-being is equally important, that actually they can only do that work if they're well. They can only help their patients if they're well. Of course, we need to train our doctors, teach our students to balance between their social lives and professional life, lives. Um, and of course, we should support our colleagues. Um, and uh, I think doctors should understand, we as doctors need to know that when we are not well, we, 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 there's a risk to report to our patients. We can't give them the best possible care. You know, if you feel that uh, over the years your the, the tremor in your right hand has increased really, and you still insist on doing the most, you know, you know, the most uh, particular meticulous, you know, complicated surgery that needs to be done, you you that's injustice to your patient. So we need to say that you know what, enough is enough. I can't do that. I've done that over the last so many years. I need to move on. Let me train somebody else to take over from me, that sort of thing. But know that when you have reduced competence, you are either a you are actually at a risk to your patient. And to your colleagues, because you know, we are always, you know. And then of course, doctors, self-diagnosis, self-treatment. You know, I think I have this. Uh, let me go to the pharmacy, write down some false name sometimes, that happens. Or write my own name, or tell the pharmacist I need this and that and that the other. Uh, and it's not once, but over and over and over again. Um, I think we need to, to encourage our doctors to desist from that. And of course, as I said, when we are handling our colleagues, use the same level of, of uh, uh, fortunately, my gastroenterologist, the doctor, junior to me in the profession. But every time I call him and I say, what about this? He says, I'm not going to talk to you about this on the phone. Can you come to my the clinic? And then he comes, I come to the clinic, and then he wears his white coat and sits in front of me. And I have to sit, and I have to listen, and I should not influence him, and I, I must promise not to say anything that, that will make, that will influence him, and uh, you know, that sort of thing. And you can imagine looking at your senior, uh, and you, you're doing, but you're doing the right thing, and the thing that's in the best, the best of interest. The la I think it should be the last one. Yeah, pre-service CPD, and, and I, um, I don't know whether yes, uh, stress management, time management, training, communication skills, gender awareness, many times, you know, we, these are things that we need to think about, mental health training of doctors, 
as, as continuing professional development uh, programs, and also teamwork as well. Um, on the next, I think that should be it. No, okay. It's burnout prevention strategies for, as employers, as managers, are very, very important. And of course, we must recognize the good performance. And many times in the medical field, uh, it's a bit difficult, but when people have begun, we've begun that tradition, trying to get that culture of trying to recognize those that do well. Though we didn't see our seniors doing it to us, but at least the, those of us who are there now, I think it's something that we are trying to do now. And it's very, very important. So I wanted to share this with you and just say that I think we need to, um, we all have um, problems, uh, health problems. Um, I don't think there's anybody who's not going to get. So you can raise your hand and say, I'm not going to get. Uh, and I and, and Dr. Njenga and Dr. Natoli will take care of you. Uh, but, <laughs> but it is something that is inevitable as we grow old. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. Um, our load of work in this part of the world, whatever we do, the issues you've been talking about, the sick health system, um, it's something that we need to deal with. And we can't deal with it unless we are well. So, guys, let's keep ourselves well. Uh, Unfortunately, my football team didn't make it because of the yellow vaccine requirements. The fever vaccine requirement. They stopped at the border last night. They slept in Busia. They are now on the on the way back, uh, back to. But they 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 will definitely thrash you thoroughly. Very, in August, when you come, they are very angry group of people right now. But um, we we you know, I just want to say, let's take time. Let's enjoy ourselves. We only have one life. Uh, let's have a good time while we're serving. Enjoy our profession. Um, but um, don't feel sorry for me. Don't feel sorry for people who are sick. But empathize with me. I don't even know that I need empathy. I'm more active than many people. <laughs> and, uh, and I think we shall make it. With all the support, we shall. Let's be our brother's keepers. Let's look after each other. And, and, and we shall make it. We shall get there. And uh, the public will enjoy our services. Thank you very much. Yeah.